a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I am Sarthak Bakchi uh, and I welcome you to the seminar and lecture series at the School of Arts and Sciences, Ahmedabad University. Today is, uh, is a very special uh, seminar and lecture series event um, as the subject of today's uh, lecture is a great uh, Indian nationalist leader, uh, Dada Bhai Naoroji. And uh, at a time when nationalism is being contested, when is being debated, uh, who is a nationalist and who is not a nationalist. Uh, we are having different kind of tags uh, being thrown at historical figures about who was right and who was wrong. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, point in time uh, to reflect uh, and to understand the nuances and understand the complexities of the historical figures uh, that we have had and that we have seen uh, who have shaped our India's uh, independence movement and India's uh, the journey of nationalism uh, in uh, in India. So we could not have asked for anybody better than today's speaker, Dr. Dinya Patel, for uh, enlightening us and throwing insights on the life and career of uh, such uh, and such a great Indian nationalist leader. Uh, for today's uh, lecture, we have with us. Um, a student uh, from the undergraduate program, a third year student of history, uh, Nishita Mandhawa, who will be introducing today's speaker for all of you. And uh, with that, I welcome all of you to this seminar and lecture series event. And I hope that you will be all uh, enjoying and learning a lot of insights from today's lecture. Uh, Nishita, over to you. Yeah. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. It is my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Danyar Patel. Uh, Dr. Danyar Patel is an assistant professor of history at the SP Jain Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai. He is also affiliated to the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. Prior to his move to Mumbai, Dr. Patel has, uh, has taught in the Department of History at the University of South Carolina. He received his PhD in history from Harvard University in 2015. His biography of Dada Bhai Naroji, titled Naroji Pioneer of Indian Nationalism, was published by Harvard University Press in May 2020. He teaches courses on modern South Asia, the Indian nationalist movement, and the British Empire. Most of his research has focused on the life and career of Dada Bhai Naroji, arguably one of the most significant Indian nationalist leaders before Gandhi. Besides this, his research uh, also focuses on the Indian nationalist movement, the city of Mumbai, and the Parsi Zoroastrian community. Dr. Patel is the recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities for his research. In addition to academic writing, he also regularly writes for esteemed popular publications, including the BBC News, The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, The, the New York Times Online, The Hindu, The Indian Express, and The Scroll. It gives us great pleasure to welcome him today to Ahmedabad University and learn more insights about the life and times of Dada Bhai Naroji from Dr. Danyar Patel. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Nishita, and, and to Sarthak for, for uh, those introductions. I, I really appreciate it, and it, it's great to know that uh, we have we have uh, undergrad students also uh, on this call. Uh, so I will be giving uh, a PowerPoint presentation also. The topic of, of my talk, obviously, is, is Naroji, the person, but um, I have three questions which kind of round out the talk. I mean, one was, you know, two, two of them relate to uh, Naroji's uh, picture, you know, Naroji's role in, in, in the larger street. Uh, stream of say nationalism and, and, and politics uh, in India and Great Britain in the sense of how Naroji was able to be get to be elected uh, as an Indian uh, to uh, the British Parliament as early as 1892 and um, you know how Naroji's uh, career relates to the beginning of Indian nationalism but but the third question is again particular I think to uh, many of your interests at Ahmedabad University in the sense that uh, you know Naroji was obviously someone who grew up in a Gujarati speaking community of Parsi and you know he was from Bombay and uh, he had extensive familial and business and uh, uh, political links throughout Gujarat. So to, to what degree did Gujarat and the Gujarati speaking world uh, shape Naroji's career as well? So that's a third question which I'll be addressing uh, today. Um, now, 
the book that I've written was published uh, last year. It, it covers uh, the life of this, this individual who uh, does not get much attention right now. I mean, you see someone who, who obviously is, is nowhere near as uh, politically useful as a Dilak or a Savarkar or uh, you know, what have you. I mean, he belongs to a generation of people like Gokhale and Ranade who uh, you know, were, were pretty incredible in the, in the day and time, but were, were summarily uh, quickly forgotten. Um, and you know, one of the reasons I wanted to embark on this book was to highlight the importance of such individuals and also kind of take them out of, of a Victorian mold uh, and uh, you know, express their ideas and contributions, uh, keeping in mind the longer arc of Indian nationalism and also where India is today in terms of uh, the, the political uh, climate. So Naroji is perhaps best known to most people for one or two or three things, right? I mean, the, the sense that people know that he, he wrote this book, Poverty and Un-British Rule in, in India. And I actually spend very little time talking about the book in my, uh, in my own book, because uh, Poverty and Un-British Rule is actually a compilation of, of many of his different writings. So I kind of take them apart bit by bit, uh, rather than looking at the book in general. Uh, and the second big thing that he's really known for is the fact that he won election to the British Parliament in 1892 and uh, became what was known as the, the first Indian member of the British Parliament. Now, of course, there were a few people before him who had part Indian descent who uh, were elected to the British Parliament, but he's, he's undoubtedly the first uh, individual who identified as an Indian, uh, politically, culturally, uh, nationally. Uh, and so it's a, it's a significant moment. Uh, and especially from the standpoint of uh, study of the broader British Empire, uh, a moment when you know, social Darwinist ideas were so strong and racism was so uh, you know, pervasive everywhere uh, how can an Indian be elected, right, from, from a constituency right at the heart of the British Empire? Uh, and what was this Indian doing, right, you know, walking right in, within the halls of power at the center of the British Empire? How is this possible? So I'm going to take you through a few facets of his career. Uh, I'll be working relatively chronologically, and, and we'll be jumping around geographically between places like Bombay, other parts of India, and, and Great Britain. Uh, so this will be you know, geographically expansive as well as chronologically as well. Uh, now, Naroji had his roots, again, in this Gujarati-speaking world. Um, and if you go to Navsari, just down the road, uh, well, just pretty much halfway between where you and I are, uh, you will see a house called the uh, Naroji birthplace uh, in uh, an old Parsi Vat in, in, in Navsari. It's one of the few old surviving houses in this particular area. Uh, it's been partially renovated. That's a whole other story, but it's, it's undoubtedly old. Um, we don't know the precise links with Naroji. It's described again as being the birthplace of Dadabai Naroji. That's incorrect uh, because Naroji himself uh, talks about how he was born in Bombay. Uh, it probably is somehow related to his paternal family. Uh, because we know that his parents migrated from the area around Navsari and Dharampur uh, just prior to his birth, so maybe around 1823, 1824, 1825, uh, and his family had long links in Navsari. They were members of a, a, a Parsi family, which was priestly, uh, and therefore due to uh, these priestly fetish, so family trees, you can actually trace back his ancestry uh, quite a long time, I mean, hundreds of years. Uh, so, you know, this family tree, which was done in the 1920s, uh, you can trace lineage all the way back to uh, the Mughal era. You see Naroji's uh, name highlighted over there. Uh, so the family was moored in Southern Gujarati culture, the Parsi environment over there, Baroda, uh, the Baroda princely state, since Navsari was a part of it, but they also had links with Dharampur, which was a, a much smaller princely state in Gujarat also. Um, and we'll see throughout his life, these, these links play an important role. I mean, his family continues to have close relations with parts of Gujarat, uh, which, which they had come from. Now, Naroji was actually born, as I said, in Bombay. He was born in a place called Kharak. Uh, and, you know, Kharak is a, is, is, a, is a neighborhood that today is close by to Bendi Bazaar. So I've, I've put some modern landmarks on this map from 1855. Um, it was uh, a place radically different from Navsari in the sense that it was cosmopolitan. Uh, his neighbors were uh, not just Parsis, but also uh, members of the, the Jewish community, Muslims, Hindus, um, you know, members of different trading castes from Gujarat and, and uh, different groups from across Maharashtra, uh, as well as people really from across the, the subcontinent, as well as uh, a lot of Britons who lived just north of him in, in the area of Baikala and also had businesses to the south of him in, in Fort. Uh, so this is you know, a very cosmopolitan uh, environment in which he grows up in. Uh, and you see signs of it reflected in his education, the sense that you know, Naroji began his education like many other Gujarati speaking individuals uh, in Bombay who were privileged enough to have an education, the sense that he went to a, a Pachshara, which were, where instruction was done in Gujarati. 
but at a relatively young age, uh, his father died, um, and his mother decided to put him into a um, an experiment in public school in Bombay, something run by an organization called the Bombay uh, Native Education Society, which was uh, a group of people, both Britons and Indians, who decided to get together, open a few schools uh, where Gujarati, Marathi, and English were the medium of, instru media of instruction, um, and uh, education was provided to worthy students for free. Uh, so this was a place where you know people who were relatively rich, as well as people who were quite poor, uh, mingled side by side in the classroom. And Naroji was comparatively quite poor. Uh, you know, the little information we have on uh, his time as a school child uh, talks about how, you know, even, you know, when he, when he goes to school, he goes in torn clothes. Uh, you know, his, his family comes from a, a much poorer part of, of, of the city. Uh, his father died, so you know, there wasn't much family support. Um, he apparently was even discriminated upon uh, based on the fact that he came from a poor family. I mean, one or two of his British instructors would kind of point out the fact of his poverty. Uh, so, you know, here you have a very early example of how uh, public education was helping to um, level the playing field, so to speak, right? I mean, Naroji as a Parsi was still relatively an elite, right? I don't want to compare him with other poor people in Bombay because that comparison doesn't work, but, but he was someone who did have definite disadvantages and he felt uh, a great deal of obligation uh, a, a, great deal, a great deal of debt that he had to repay for the fact that he had this opportunity to lift himself out of relative poverty and attend uh, a school where he learned English, he learned British history, uh, he learned British literature. Um, this is stuff which was completely unavailable to other members of his family. Um, and it translated into um, a college education at Elphinstone. Uh, now, many of you know this particular building in Kalagoda. This was not the building that Naroji attended as a, as a, a college student. Uh, Elphinstone was located close by to what is today Toby Chalau, the, the metro cinema area. Uh, but uh, you know, it was then, like it was up until relatively recently, uh, one of the you know, premier institutions in India and, and definitely the premier uh, educational institution in Western India. Uh, and here again, Naroji uh, you know, is an example of someone whose life is transformed by education. I mean, his, his instructors are Scotsmen, they are Irishmen, uh, they are a few Indians who are teaching him as well. Uh, in general, they're quite progressive in their outlook toward uh, India. So there's a very close collaborative relationship uh, that you see here that you do not see in places like Calcutta, for example, uh, between the students and the faculty. Um, and this has a, a great influence on his ideas of how, say, Britons and Indians can cooperate together and what Indians can do in kind of a liberal uh, political uh, uh, environment. Uh, now, Roji, by all accounts, was a polymath. Uh, he did very well in, in a variety of subjects. He was he was heir to a much longer kind of West Indian tradition of, of being, uh, you know, a polymath. People like Naroji Fardunji or, or others before him uh, who were in the structures were also people who, who could teach in like Shakespeare in one class and calculus in another. And so, uh, you know, if you look at some of the earliest records that we have for Elphinstone, when Naroji actually graduates and goes on to become a, a member of the teaching staff at Elphinstone, we can actually find uh, the mathematics papers that he gives to his students. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, math papers that you, know, you would have taken if you were a student of his. Uh, so, you know, he was, he was loved within the Elphinstone community because not only was he a student, but he eventually rejoins as a faculty member and he eventually becomes the, the first Indian appointed as a full professor at Elphinstone uh, and therefore the first Indian appointed at a, you know, government-run college in, in India, which was, again, quite a big distinction. And he was, he was doing this by the time he was around 29 years of age. Uh, you know, which is phenomenal, obviously, even in, in our day, for those of us who are our professors know. Um, so, you know, he had his academic career, but he also took a very strong interest in uh, social and political activities. And one of the biggest social activities he was involved in during his early years in Elphinstone was female education. Uh, he was interested in promoting educational opportunities for women, because as we know, in this era, you know, those opportunities were about nil, aside from, you know, a few missionary institutions. Um, it was not just the Parsi community where he was interested in promoting female education. Uh, he took part in, in, organizational, in organizational work where uh, students who spoke Marathi or Gujarati, you know, Hindu, Hindu Gujaratis would, uh, would attend these schools. Uh, so, you know, this was something where he faced a great degree of opposition, but managed to get several hundred uh, uh, Parsi girls uh, to attend schools by the 1850s or so. Uh, and he also immersed himself in a much broader world of those individuals who speak uh, so, you know, his activities in female education were having ramifications as far away as Ahmedabad. It, 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 it encouraged uh, people like the Nagar Sheth of, of Ahmedabad to, to open a school. 
uh, for, for uh, you know, female education to, to start in Ahmedabad as well. Uh, and the other way which Nauruji communicated with a bunch of broader Gujarati speaking audience uh, was through print, uh, through the newspaper, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the print economy of, of this era. Uh, he was uh, an editor for a paper called Ras Gufta, which started in 1851. Um, and uh, you know, this was a paper that was very reformist in orientation. It originally started off as being uh, Parsi centric, but expanded to include non Parsis on its staff and expanded to include within its content, uh, you know, things of, of national importance. Uh, and it, it campaigned for, you know, economic reform, social reform, political reform, what have you. Um, and, uh, you know, it did so in a way that was accessible to the poor. Uh, the first editions of this paper were, were actually subsidized, uh, they were distributed for free. Uh, and you know the, the you know the first print run, as you can you know maybe see on the, on this uh, document, had a thousand copies, uh, which was phenomenal in this era, right? I mean, uh, Raskoftar might have become one of the highest circulating papers in in India, all of India, uh, by the 1870s or so, uh, after Naroji is out of the picture. Uh, so Naroji is, is taking part in a much broader uh, you know uh, you know uh, community than just say the Parsis or, or Bombay centric uh, you know. Uh, uh, things going on within Bombay itself, and it's apparent even you know when you, when you look at how Naroji is described in different languages. I mean, this is this is from a um, uh, you know a, 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 a journal that was affiliated with this larger project of female education, three both, uh, and you see that in English he's described as you know the grand old man of, of, of India, but in Gujarati is Sri uh, Kelavni ane Sudar sorry Sansar Sudarno Mahan Yota, you know this this great kind of uh, proponent or reformer. Uh, you know, in charge of female education, uh, you know, and, you know, social upliftment. Uh, so, you know, in, in different languages, he's being described in, uh, you know, in, in different ways, which kind of, I think, gives you an indication of how, uh, you know, his reputation was burnished in, uh, in a specific sense uh, within the Gujarati speaking uh, world. Uh, so he became a part of this movement called Young Bombay, uh, which had, uh, you know, the Gujarati speaking world as a component, but also the, you know, Marathi speaking world, and also, you know, much larger, uh, slice of Indian society, which was campaigning for elements of, of you know, educational reform, social reform, the get, you know, getting rid of things like superstitious practices, and eventually political reform. I mean, he takes part in uh, the, you know, the, a, a Bombay society, which uh, something called the Bombay Association, which was really kind of the first attempt at uh, a modern political organization in, in uh, this part of Western India. Uh, and they petition parliament, they, you know, they write about the need for reform. So, you know, his political career begins here. Uh, in Bombay uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. Now, let me transition to uh, you know, another aspect of his career, the, 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 the aspect that follows thereafter. Um, in the year 1855, Naroji takes the, the rather fateful step of deciding to uh, migrate to, to Great Britain uh, in order to take up a, a position in, in, a, in a company uh, with a few other Pisces working in London. Um, and this trip to uh, Europe, you know, he travels by boat from, from Bombay through uh, the Red Sea, uh, you know, from Aden to Cairo, Alexandria, Malta, Marseille, and onward from there to Paris and, and, uh, and London, uh, it's transformative uh, because he sees uh, parts of the world which, you know, like Aden and Egypt are poor, like India, uh, and parts of the world like France and Great Britain, which are just astoundingly, unimaginably rich. Um, and, you know, if, if you look within what he describes to his readership in Raskoftar, he's still writing for Raskoftar uh, at the stage, uh, you know, he's, he's spellbound. Uh, he's, you know, once he sees France and in Great Britain, he says, this is what we in India need to aspire to. So from an early era, again, we see uh, a conscious understanding on Naroji's part of the poverty that you face in a place like India and the incredible prosperity of a place like Paris or London or Liverpool. Um, and this is highlighted, um, you know, while Naroji is abroad uh, through his involvement in the cotton industry. I mean, he's, he's working in the, in the larger cotton economy. And those of you who have read Sven Beckel's book, Empire of Cotton, know how India was a part of it and how, you know, both in both positive and deeply negative ways, it was impacted uh, by this global cotton economy. Uh, and a lot of Naruti's views built off his um, involvement in the cotton economy, seeing how India's fortunes were, were dragged and pulled depending on events like the American Civil War, which caused tremendous, uh, you know, wealth and then tremendous poverty when uh, the Civil War ended. Um, and at the same time, he's also observing mass famine. Uh, that's occurring in India. I mean, again, he's doing this at a distance, right? When he's in London, he travels occasionally back to, to India, uh, you know, to visit his family and such. Uh, but, you know, this is an era when, you know, I mean, the late 
19th century uh, is, is an era when, uh, you know, millions and millions of Indians died in these horrific famines, right? Um, you know, there's this uh, famous book, you know, Late Victorian Holocausts, which, which documents in part, uh, you know, the, the devastation of these famines. And Naroji is observing them either from London or in person in Bombay. Uh, and, you know, this is the basis for his work on poverty. Uh, you know, understanding, you know, why India is going through these terrible things, famine, uh, the vagaries of, you know, the cotton economy. Um, and, you know, this is how he starts to really uh, put together a lot of statistical work studying poverty. Uh, so, you know, what he does really from the 1860s onward is, is try to answer a fundamental question. Why, why is India so poor? Uh, why is it so poor in relation to Great Britain? And, and why is it seemingly getting poorer every year? Um, and, you know, this is, again, you know, how Naruji comes up with his, uh, his, his idea of the drain theory, the, the, the idea that uh, every year India is getting poorer and poorer, and that poverty is due to uh, wealth being physically taken out of the country um, by uh, the British. Uh, now, as I said, you know, this was an academic, you know, kind of like an academic study. I mean, you saw the statistics on the previous page, and I mentioned that he was doing a lot of this work in London, uh, but he also comes back to India, and when he goes to India, he uh, goes on the ground, uh, again, to places in Gujarat. You see in this, this article, he's talking, uh, you know, the, the, the newspapers talk about how he's traveling to Katiawad and Kutch and, and other parts of Gujarat, presumably Baroda, just to see what poverty is like, right? And, and examining conditions and talking to farmers. Uh, and, you know, throughout his academic work on poverty, uh, you see that his references to, say, things like a farmer in Punjab or someone who works in a mill in Bengal uh, or someone in Gujarat. So, you know, it's not just dispassionate uh, academic study based on statistics. It's also based on a lot of conversations with people whose lives are actually being affected by uh, this process of impoverishment. And a lot of that came again through Gujarat. So Naruji starts to put together a, a really damning set of statistics on, uh, you know, he, he, he makes the first attempt to, to calculate, you know, the, the average income of an Indian. Uh, and he discovers that the average income of an Indian, you know, he, he kind of, you know, takes certain taxation rates and uh, factors in, you know, what the rates of taxation are versus the revenue collected. And he comes up with this figure that, you know, on average, an Indian earns about two uh, pounds uh, a year, uh, which is devastating uh, from the standpoint of the British argument that, uh, you know, Britain has made India more, uh, more, uh, more wealthy and more prosperous because, you know, in comparison to, to, to India, the average Britain is making 33 pounds, right? So, uh, you know, an average Britain is 15 times more wealthy than, than in India. Um, and Naroji would take that statistic of, you know, two pounds per head uh, and contrast it with the idea of what you could do with two pounds. Uh, and the answer to that question was, you couldn't do much. In fact, he showed through statistics that with two pounds a year, you could barely keep yourself alive. Uh, more money was spent by the British government to imprison uh, an Indian and keep that Indian, you know, in good health with food and proper clothing uh, than the average Indian could get uh, through, you know, two pounds. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's through a series of, of comparative analyses, Naroji establishes that the reason why India is on uh, the cusp of famine all the time is because with two pounds, you are always living on the edge of starvation. Okay, and if something like a delay in the monsoon happens and a famine occurs, you're dead. Okay, uh, so we see a, a particular uh, trajectory in his in his economic thought that eventually veers much more towards the political economic, uh, in the sense that you know from his his early writings writings he's talking about the drain uh, theory, uh, the idea that British rule was uh, you know impoverishing India. Uh, he eventually comes up with the idea that a bulk of this impoverishment is taking place directly by British officers. Uh, the fact that Indians are paying for these British officers, paying their salaries, and these salaries are eventually going back to Great, Great Britain, that was a huge uh, drain on the exchequer. Uh, so he comes up with political ideas. Uh, instead of Britons running the country, let's have Indians. Um, this idea of simultaneous examinations, that Indians uh, could uh, take exams to join the civil service in India, Previously, they had to go to London, which was, of course, a huge expense for them. Uh, and if we get more Indians in the civil service through simultaneous examinations, we therefore can have more Indians who are more cost efficient, who are more inclined to develop policies which are more in keeping with uh, Indian you know, demands and, and uh, Indian desires. Um, you can have the civil service eventually Indianized. Uh, and you know, from once you get to that idea that you know, the civil service could progressively become more Indian, it's only a few leaps to come to the idea of, of self-government. I mean, what, what if instead of the civil service being, say, 75% Indian, uh, you could have 100% Indian? 
Uh, and Narochi comes to this idea by 1884, uh, which is insanely early from, you know, from the standpoint of, of Indian nationalism, uh, the idea of you know, some sort of self-government uh, at this early stage. Um, and uh, you know, it, it was built, this idea of Swaraj and self-government was built intrinsically on uh, the study of poverty. Because again, the reason why uh, you know, the full Indianization of the civil service is justified is because it was a way to stop the drain of wealth. So while Naroji is talking about these political and economic ideas with regard to India, he's also engaging with ideas uh, more broadly discussed uh, throughout Europe and uh, you know, other parts of the world like America and, and even places like Japan and such. Uh, he uses a lot of uh, the ideas of John Stuart Mill uh, to discuss uh, ideas of capitalism with regard to India. So you know, when he talks about the need for capital in India, he refers to uh, you know, uh, Mill's principles of, of political economy uh, to you know, essentially make the point that since India is being drained of capital, it, it's, it's like a cyclical process of India continuously getting poorer. Uh, at the same time, you know, he might have had a hand in influencing the ideas of Karl Marx. Uh, we do not know whether Marx and Naroji actually met one another. Uh, they, they certainly lived next to one, you know, cl relatively close by to one another in, in London uh, in, in the 70s and, and, and the 60s of the 19th century. Uh, but they had a common friend, uh, Henry Hinman who was a, a socialist leader. Uh, and that uh, common friend certainly uh, put uh, Marx you know, uh, in touch with some of Naroji's writings uh, towards the very end of his life. And we, we, we know that Naroji, uh, sorry, Marx wrote one letter to a, a, a Russian Narodnik economist, uh, Nikolai Danielson, which talked about a drain of wealth. Um, and it's probably no coincidence that this letter was written not too far after Hinman had uh, written to um, uh, Marx talking about Naroji's economic work. Uh, so you, you see indirect influence, perhaps, you know, at the most cautious level, perhaps direct influence if you want to be a little, uh, you know, more reckless in, in making conclusions. Uh, but, you know, some linking of the ideas of, uh, you know, one of the world's greatest economic thinkers of the 19th century with one of India's greatest economic thinkers of, of that period as well. Um, so, with regard to poverty uh, and you know, study of it in relation to political ideas, I want to talk a little bit about how it uh, affected things on the ground uh, closer to uh, you know, your place of, of residence and study in, in Gujarat. Uh, Naroji had tremendous links throughout his life with the princely states of Gujarat. Uh, so you know, his family came from Navsari, which again was in Baroda, and his, um, his, his parents and grandparents uh, farmed in, in Dharampur, which was another princely state close by to uh, um, uh, to Navsari, uh, and throughout his life, he had you know very strong links with several states, in particular in, in, in Gujarat. And I've I've just named a few of them over here. So in Baroda, we'll talk about quite a bit. Uh, but even smaller states in Saurashtra, like uh, Gondal and uh, uh, Bhavnagar, Jamnagar, or Navanagar, um, he had uh, you know strong ties. And then in Kutch, he had a um, you know family ties which extended all the way actually up until the 1970s. Uh, there were Naroji family members living there all the way until. I think actually 1980 when the last one passed away. Uh, so, you know, what explains these uh, these links with Gujarati principal states? Uh, well, the reason is is that you know one component of Naroji's idea of the drain of wealth was that uh, princely India might actually be more prosperous than British India. Uh, it did not have the same drain of wealth uh, that British India had because it was governed by Indians. Uh, and you see that Naroji develops a whole other set of calculations to kind of try to make this point. Um, and, you know, this idea is integrated with a large facet of early Indian nationalism. Uh, could the princes be yoked uh, to the cause of Indian nationalism? Could they actually help uh, put forth the idea that Indians were fit and able to rule themselves? Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think Manu Pillai's latest book, which I haven't got a chance to read as yet, talks a lot about this dynamic uh, with regard to states like Baroda and, and Mysore and Travancore, about how, again, a lot of these early nationalists look to princely states uh, to be places that could act as political laboratories. Uh, and Narochi was one of them because, uh, you know, in, in 1873, he's appointed by uh, Malarao Gaikwad, the, the ruler of Baroda, to be Diwan. Um, and during this, uh, you know, very brief Diwanship, which lasts for a little over a year, uh, Narochi brings a lot of the products of Elphinstone College, uh, a lot of these very educated, Western oriented individuals to wholesale transform the administration of Baroda state to make it more modern. So he brings in people like Kazi Shahabuddin, who's, uh, you know, a, 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 a very kind of like reform minded uh, intellectual from Bombay. Um, you know, he brings in people like Bal Mangesh Vagle to, to kind of 
uh, who again you know comes from this kind of um, you know liberal um, circle in, in, uh, coming out of Elphinstone, uh, and they do their bit to kind of transform and modernize the administration. Uh, they do stuff like you know lower land assessment rates, which hadn't been lowered since the time of the American Civil War when you know everyone was getting very rich. Um, but they run into a lot of problems also, which again express the limitations of just how far you could go with princely states. Uh, because Malara Gaikwad was, by all accounts, uh, not the most stable of rulers, uh, to, say the, to say the least. Uh, and he was engaged in, in, in an in a absolutely fierce war uh, with the British resident uh, for political control. Uh, and Naruti was caught up in this. You know, he, he took part in uh, you know, these uh, yards that were written to the British government uh, asking for uh, the resident uh, Robert Fair to be removed. And Fair was also equally crazy <laughs> in his own ways. He was a, a very kind of messianic uh, Christian who, uh, you know, had it out for uh, for Indians in many ways. So, you know, he was kind of, Naroji was was literally stuck between a rock and a hard place at this time. And he, he finally tenders his resignation uh, in late 1874, which is actually at a good time because just shortly after that, um, uh, you know, uh, Malara was removed by the British government uh, because uh, the British government feels that he's had a hand in actually poisoning fair, uh, which was a huge scandal in that era. Uh, and Naroji takes part in kind of, you know, working with the British authorities to see what exactly had happened. And eventually, you know, this Maharaja is deposed and uh, a young boy comes on the throne, who of course is Saiji, Saiji Rao Gaikwad. Uh, so this whole episode was quite disillusioning to Naroji. Uh, it, it ends in, in shambles. I mean, they, they did a part in modernizing the infrastructure of the state, but ultimately, you know, it, it comes to a humiliating end. But I think what is significant is that Naroji does not give up on his ties with princely states. Uh, he continues to correspond with, with uh, princely rulers throughout his life. Uh, he's writing to rulers of small states. So here's a, a letter from uh, the ruler of Dharampur. Uh, around the time that Naroji is elected to parliament and he's, you know, the, the ruler is asking, you know, can you bring up my affairs in parliament once you're in it? Uh, but he's also talking with uh, rulers of fairly larger states like uh, Kingarji, who's, uh, who's the, the, the Rao, the Maharao of Kutch. Uh, and Kingarji's father, Pragmalji, had actually uh, worked with Naroji to kind of diffuse a, a big conflict in the 1860s. Uh, and Kingarji returned the favor to Naroji because Naroji's family, uh, through his son, uh, lived in in uh, in uh, in Kutch, uh, and when his son passed away suddenly uh, in 1892, uh, Kingarji gives royal support to Naroji's descendants there, uh, you know, and 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 you know enables a lot of uh, uh, you know Naroji's grandchildren to have an education. He kind of steps in as as almost a, a, a quasi fatherly figure after Naroji's son passes away and leaves uh, eight children with, without without a father figure. Um, and of course, the links with other rulers, people like Bhagwat Sinji, uh, who I'll talk about a little bit later. But you see kind of this very symbiotic relationship developing between princely rulers and people like Naroji and the nationalist movement. Uh, these princely rulers provide money uh, and assistance uh, to early nationalists. And these early nationalists do the political bidding of these rulers uh, in London. They lobby on their behalf. So Bhagwat Sinji, for example, got caught up in a paternity suit. Uh, he might have had an illegitimate child in, in, uh, in, in London. Uh, and so people like Naroji and Beramji Malbari, who was also a close aide of, of, of Naroji, uh, kind of helped Bhag Bhagwat Sinji in his legal problems. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, a kind of symbiotic relationship is developed, which gives us an opportunity to talk about where Naroji's career goes after he moves uh, into politics in London. So as I mentioned, from 1855 onward, Naroji really had one foot in Great Britain. Uh, you know, from 1855 through really, you know, 1907, uh, Naroji spends a good chunk of his time in Britain uh, while going back to India for several years uh, at small stretches. Okay, he has his family there. He's also operating a business. Uh, he has, of course, political ties there. Um, but by the 1880s, he really puts down roots in Great Britain, uh, specifically in 1885, 1886, uh, right right after the, you know, the first Indian National Congress in December 1885, uh, because he decides to stand for the British Parliament. Uh, and the reason why he decides to stand is, again, you know, he's developed this idea of you know, the drain of wealth and the need to Indianize the civil service. Uh, and he thinks the, the best way to do it was actually through Parliament. You could not ask reform uh, to you know, the, the white, um, you know, the, uh, the white uh, Maharajas or, 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 you know, or, or, or Sahib sitting in Calcutta or, or Shimla because they were just too reactionary. So you had a better chance in London where you had many MPs who were actually quite sympathetic 
uh, to India's political concerns. Uh, so he, by and large, jo joins the Liberal Party. He joins a lot of the organs of the Liberal Party, like the National Liberal Club, uh, and he uh, attempts to stand for, for election. Uh, and he does this in, in, in quite a unique way. So, I mean, he's, he's influenced by Liberal Party circuits, but he's also influenced by many other uh, political streams of thought in, in Vic late Victorian India. Uh, in late, sorry, late Victorian Great Britain. And, and one of the, you know, the most controversial and important streams is, of course, Irish nationalism. Um, and Naroti very presently develops links with Irish nationalists who are, you know, arguing for home rule, kind of similar to what Indians would eventually call for in terms of self-government or, you know, home rule, uh, you know, once Annie Besant and, and Tilak come to the stage is, is what Indians adopt as a goal also. Um, and these links could actually be quite strong to the sense that some Irish actually see some utility in using uh, the commonalities between Ireland and India's political demands and actually suggest that Nairobi stand for election to the British Parliament from an Irish seat. So, you know, talk about head spinning global connections on at least three occasions. Nairobi could have been elected, you know, I mean, this ultimately doesn't pan out due to local uh, political problems, but uh, on three separate occasions, the Irish political leadership considers uh, having Nairobi stand for an Irish political, uh, political seat as an Irish MP, but also someone who would reflect India's uh, concerns. Uh, now, the other great stream of thought which influences Nairobi is, of course, socialism. Uh, socialism uh, is something which, of course, really shines its light on Indian nationalism post World War I, but it gets an early start with Nairobi. And through Nairobi, you get a, a generation of people also um, by the early 20th century who are influenced in, with a lot of socialist ideas. Uh, and here again, Henry Hinman, the man who puts Nairobi's ideas in touch with Marx plays a critical role. Uh, Hinman formed the first socialist party in Great Britain, the Social Democratic Federation, uh, and Naruti was by you know, all means pretty much a proxy member of this organization. He gave uh, you know, talks to this organization, the SDF in turn supported his, uh, his parliamentary campaigns. Um, he also reaches out to women. Uh, so you know, another political stream that he uh, immerses himself in is that of uh, you know, women's suffrage uh, and feminism. Uh, so he develops uh, close ties with a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the leading fem feminists of, 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 the, of this era um, and, uh, you know, people like Josephine Butler, for example, um, and, you know, gets their moral support in turn for uh, political reform in India. So again, kind of this reciprocal relationship, as you see, with the princely states between uh, members of, of constituencies, which you wouldn't imagine being interested in Indian nationalism. Uh, and again, these, these links went so deep that, you know, on occasion, Naruti would share the stage with people like uh, uh, Rukmabai, you know, the, 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 the famous uh, you know, you know, Indian woman who kind of refused to cohabit with, with her husband and took it to court, and also Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the American uh, uh, suffragist. Uh, so, you know, Naruti was really plugged into international connections, uh, not just for things like socialism, but also things like feminism. He actually goes and attends um, conferences put on by his feminist friends in places like uh, Switzerland, Geneva, uh, in, the, in the 1890s. Uh, so all of this adds up to kind of a, a grand strategy on Naroji's part. I mean, he's, he's trying to get Britons interested in India because that's, you know, kind of the best way that he can kind of relate to, to British voters. You know, vote for me because, uh, you know, I have something to tell you about your biggest colonial possession. Uh, it's not being run very well and here's why. Uh, but he also, through these networks with socialists or feminists or what have you, Irish, uh, he's able to develop strong links with uh, domestic political considerations in, in Great Britain as well, uh, which transform him into, again, someone who is a supporter of workers' rights or someone who is a supporter of Irish home rule. And that made him more appealing as a potential uh, MP for you know people uh, sitting in a constituency in Great Britain. Now, of course, um, you know, being elected as, a, as, a, as an Indian for, uh, for parliament in this era was a very uphill challenge. Uh, Nauruti stood once in 1886 and lost in, in Holborn. Uh, in 1888, he stands again uh, as a liberal uh, candidate in central Finsbury, which is uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the area to the, the, the northeast of St. Pancras in London, uh, quite a nice area uh, today, uh, with a long, very, you know, very long socialist kind of leftist tradition, uh, which, which helped Nauruti. Uh, but even in this quite leftist bastion, where there was a large Irish population which was sympathetic to Naroji, Naroji encountered a great deal of racism. Uh, now, that racism was balanced out to a degree by anti-racism. I mean, there were strong anti-racist links in the Victorian era as well. Uh, but, you know, 
1889, it got to the point where even the Prime Minister of Britain, um, Lord Salisbury, uh, was uh, using racist language uh, to kind of uh, you know, put down Nairobi and his parliamentary campaigns. Uh, Salisbury very famously referred to Nairobi as a black man who wouldn't get elected. Um, and that black man reference was meant in an, obviously a very derogatory way. Um, this actually helped Nairobi because, you know, even by the standards of Victorian era bigotry, this was a step too far. Uh, and so Salisbury indirectly, and Salisbury had a reputation for putting his proverbial foot in his mouth, um, Salisbury, you know, kind of helped cultivate sympathy for Nairobi. Uh, and you see that this anti-racist network, these anti-racist networks of the Victorian era, uh, constantly come to help Nairobi in his parliamentary campaign. At the same time, you know, again, looking transnationally, uh, those princely state links that we talked about earlier came to Nairobi's rescue. If you were an Indian standing for parliament, you needed money. Uh, and if you got money from India, that wasn't good enough because a lot of that, the value of that money was shaved off uh, due to the exchange rate, uh, the exchange rate of the time. So you needed even more money. And the best place to get the money was from princes. Uh, so you see in Nairobi's correspondence, a lot of these very cryptic letters uh, being sent by Nairobi's aides and supporters in India, uh, basically giving him instructions about how to ask for very large wads of money uh, from princes. Uh, so here's one such letter that's sent from uh, Beramji Malbari to Nairobi. Uh, Malbari would refer to Nairobi as dad. So you know, when I looked at letters uh, in the archives, I was wondering who is this person being referred to as dad, and eventually I realized it's, it's Nairobi. Uh, but he he, he says he says things like you know, uh, talk to K, and the T will give you fifty more. And as you see on the slide, you know that basically means talk to the personal secretary of Bhagwat Singhji, the the Thakur of uh, of Gondal, and he will give you twenty five or fifty thousand more rupees. Uh, and people like um, Bhagwat Singhji or Saiji Rao uh, and others. Uh, gave fantastic sums to Nairobi, which eventually uh, enabled Nairobi to build up a campaign machinery which allowed him to win. He won by only five votes, right? In, 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 you know, after which he's dubbed Dada by Nairobi, uh, Dada by narrow majority. Uh, but again, all these international links that I've talked about come to his rescue. I mean, you know, women help canvas for, for uh, his election. They can't vote, but they help knock on the doors of men and talk to men and tell them why you should vote for Nairobi. Uh, Irish uh, men come out and support, workers come out and support, and of course those princely individuals are providing money, and the few Indians who are resident in London are campaigning for it. Uh, so you actually do see, you know, uh, a few individuals who eventually would go on to play quite a big role uh, in Indian politics, people like Joseph Baptista, potentially Jinnah, though that's a little unclear because Jinnah had a habit of exaggerating, uh, actually take part and, and campaign for Nairobi on the ground uh, in London. So it's, it's quite a fascinating episode. Uh, so Nairobi is elected at, as the MP uh, uh, from central Finsbury and also at, you know, there, thereafter as you know, the MP for India. Uh, and this is a huge moment in early internationalism. I mean, you know, when Nairobi comes back for the first time to India, supposedly half of Bombay comes out to greet him. You know, 500,000 people. The population of Bombay was 1 million, which is, of course, hard to believe because I'm sure there are only 1 million people within a mile of where I'm sitting in Bombay. Uh, but this is a huge moment uh, in Indian nationalism and within the history of the Indian National Congress. Uh, it really puts the Congress on the world stage. Uh, and it also puts on the world stage many of Nairobi's demands, specifically for, again, simultaneous examination and the Indianization of the civil service. Uh, he helps. Uh, put together a resolution in support of simultaneous examination, which is passed by the British Parliament through rather devious mechanisms, which eventually kind of piss off a lot of liberal, um, you know, colleagues of Nairobi. Uh, but it passes. Uh, but ultimately, what Nairobi learns the hard way is that you know you can garner as much support as you can amongst Irishmen and women and certain progressive parliamentarians in, in Parliament. But ultimately, the large bulk of Britons, both inside and outside of Parliament, still will mostly ignore you. Uh, they, they're not interested in Indian affairs, right? It's, it's not their constituency. It's, it's colonial subject thousands of miles away. Yes, their wealth is dependent upon India, but there's not much interest, right? Uh, so Nairobi's tone uh, in parliament becomes much more shrill and radical. Uh, uh, as you know, you know the years 1893, 1894, 1895 progress on, uh, you know, to the point where you know he's actually, uh, you know, in responses to the Queen's speech, which was meant to be kind of a show of loyalty, he's actually comparing Indians to slaves in, in the South in America. Uh, he's talking about Indians as the poorest people in the world. Um, so you know, this in turn, you know, kind of alienates Nairobi from a lot of 
moderates or conservatives. Uh, and finally, in 1895, he, he loses election, um, a re-election uh, to parliament. And this, in many ways, is kind of the lowest point in, in his career. Uh, and it brings us to the final phase of uh, you know, his career. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes just talk, uh, the, the last few minutes of my presentation just talking about um, this, this last moment. Uh, now, Rochi is 70 years old uh, at this point, and most sensible people would have probably retired, uh, gone back to Bombay if they you know, were living in a place like London and they had roots in, in Bombay. Uh, Narochi doubles down uh, and kind of accelerates his political activities and he turns far more to the left. Uh, he reaches out to socialist allies, to Irish uh, political friends, uh, and he starts mass agitation uh, for you know, calling out the British government for its, its handling of things like the plague epidemic, which of course we've heard a lot about in the past few years. Um, or mass famine in India, which was again rearing its ugly head in, in the Bombay presidency in parts of North India from 1896 onward. Um, he develops uh, more international friendships. Uh, so from at least the late 1870s, Naroji is starting to talk to people in America uh, because he, he recognizes America as kind of this, this rising power. And he sees lots of comparisons between, uh, you know, economic development as it should go in a place like America and economic development as it should not go in a place like India. He sees lots of points of comparisons and talks to a lot of industrialists and government figures consequently in America. Uh, and he reaches out to anti-imperialists in America and compares the growth of an American empire with what Britain has done to India. Uh, and this in turn interests a lot of uh, American anti-imperialists, uh, even a person as uh, prominent as William Jennings Bryan, who was the presidential candidate and, uh, 1890, uh, you know, in, in the election of, uh, of 1900, um, you know, someone who was an anti-imperialist and actually uh, saw commonality between, say, what Britain was doing in India and what Americans were threatening to do in the Philippines, which, um, you know, America had recently annexed and uh, came to this conclusion that ultimately imperialism was not just damaging for the people who were being colonized, but also for the colonizers themselves. Uh, so Naruti's ideas, you know, again, he's talking about things like a drain of wealth and uh, you know, all the different terrible political repercussions that a drain of wealth causes uh, are being translated into different imperial uh, contexts, like those of the Americans. And he's also reaching out to other Americans who are, you know, obviously not part of this imperial project, but are being affected by different forms of what we can call you know, a, a form of colonialism. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, what African Americans had, had had to deal with, not just before the Civil War, but after the Civil War, being second class citizens, uh, being re reduced to levels of you know, economic penury. Uh, so from the 1890s onward, Narochi is starting to take a greater interest in the state of African Americans. He meets visiting African Americans to London, people like Ida B. Wells, who was a founder of the NAACP. Uh, and uh, some of his writings are read by people like W.B. Du Bois, the famous African American uh, thinker and activist, who of course you know, goes on to eventually influence Martin Luther King. So we see again, a very broad arc of political ideas uh, you know, influencing one another over here. Um, and Naroji's involvements in activities of a global African diaspora um, you know, grow through this African-American link. Uh, he takes an indirect part in the first Pan-African conference, which was put on by a group of uh, West Indian migrants to London. Uh, very strategically, these people had their office, these West Indian migrants uh, had their office at a, in a building called Palace Chambers, which was right next door. Uh, to where the Indian National Congress had its office in London. Uh, so we can only imagine the state of communication between these two uh, neighbors. And we know that Naroji at least made financial donations to this organization, and uh, who knows what other links were, uh, were being you know, forged between these two groups. Um, so African-Americans, Americans, uh, the other big group that uh, takes uh, you know, a prominent role in Naroji's you know, more global understandings of politics at the stage uh, are socialists. Uh, Naroji attends the Amsterdam Socialist Congress in 1906, along with people like Hinman, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Karl Kotsky, other you know, very prominent European leaders uh, you know, are part of this uh, event and, and brings issues of Indian colonialism uh, to this body. Now, at the same time, other global links are being forged with Indians, people like Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi first corresponds with Naroji around 1893 or 1894 or so, uh, and Gandhi asked for Naroji's political support when he was just starting his career in, in Durban. Uh, and you know, this starts again about maybe you know about 15 years of, of correspondence with Naroji and and uh, and Gandhi. Uh, nowhere near as you know uh, 
you know, close and, and, and influential as, say, Gandhi's correspondence and work with someone like Gokhale, but, but still significant in its own way. Uh, and, you know, Gandhi in turn gets quite influenced by a lot of Nauruji's ideas and, and methods and tactics, at least in his, the early phase of, of his career. Now, of course, this is all taking place upon the backdrop of changes within the Congress party, right? In the, in the sense that, you know, after, say, 1904, 1905, the Congress is increasingly splitting into moderate uh, and radical factions. Uh, and Nauruji, who had always been seen as kind of the vanguard of a more radical um, element of the Congress, is now increasingly falling between two extremes. Uh, the radicals are seeing him as too moderate, the moderates are seeing him as too radicals. Uh, so much so that, uh, you know, when um, the Congress takes place in 1906 uh, in Calcutta, uh, Nauruji is, is picked as kind of a compromise candidate between moderates and radicals. He's, he's the only person uh, who's, who's kind of appealing to both, uh, you know, the group that Tilak is leading and the group that people like Gokhale and Firosha Mehta are leading. Uh, and this forms one element of, of really what is Nauruji's most active political year, uh, 1906, when, when he's 80. Okay, so, you know, someone who is now an octogenarian is not slowing down. Uh, he does a, a series of pretty incredible things in his 80th year. Uh, first of all, he writes letters to the British Prime Minister, uh, Henry Campbell Bannerman, demanding self-government for India. Uh, he talks about self-government being under something called British paramountcy, which is something I'll get to in just a second. Uh, he also campaigns once more for parliament. He loses. Uh, but, you know, he keeps up these demands for uh, some sort of big reform on the part of the British. So he actually categorizes Swaraj uh, as a form of reparation that Great Britain can give to India. Uh, he actually sets out in one of these letters to Campbell Bannerman kind of about a 20-year plan of what you know, Britain would do to give India uh, a measure of self-government. He also talks with Gandhi, meets Gandhi in London when Gandhi comes to London in 1906 to campaign uh, for, for political rights uh, of South African Indians. And of course, he goes back to uh, India uh, in late 1906 uh, to take part in the Calcutta Congress. And again, as I said, Naroji fell between these two ends of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the political spectrum in the Congress, and his speech really helped determine the future course of the Congress, uh, in the sense that the speech that he gave, uh, you know, was far too radical for the moderates, uh, and in many ways satisfied many of the demands of the radicals. Uh, he called for Swaraj, uh, previously, he had talked about, again, Swaraj under British paramountcy. Now he just called for Swaraj, plain and simple. Uh, so he, he has this deliberately vague phrase where he says India needed self-government or Swaraj like in the United Kingdom or like in the colonies. Now, by the colonies, you meant something like Australia or Canada, where you're under British rule. Uh, but like the United Kingdom, you're a free and autonomous unit, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're not above the colonies. Uh, this was a deliberately... Uh, vaguely worded declaration of, of what Swaraj would be like. And importantly, Naroji looks around the world to justify his demands. Uh, he looks at political change that's taking place in places like China or Japan, uh, as well as places like Russia or Iran, where you know, constitutional revolutions had just taken place uh, in 1905. Um, so, you know, this last political declaration that he gives in 1906 really kind of in many ways hands the torch to the radicals. I mean, there, there are ways that the radicals are disappointed with Naroji's speech. I, I can get to that in question and answers, but it gives a fill up to people like Tilak. Uh, and you know, we know that people like Gokhale and Mehta were, were a bit disheartened by what Naroji was doing. So in this kind of last political activity that Naroji does, uh, he gives uh, impetus to a more radical stream of thought in Indian nationalism. And at the same time, does something that is noticed by people around the world. Uh, so Du Bois, who had been following Naroji for some years now, uh, once he reads Naroji's speech, he publishes, uh, you know, a very short commentary uh, in one of his uh, magazines that he publishes out of uh, the United States. And he says, you know, the dark world has awakened to life and speech, courage comrades. Uh, and that uh, is the way that he described Naroji's declaration of Swaraj. Uh, so we see, you know, again, Swaraj being interpreted in very different ways internationally, right? I mean, the Irish are talking about it in some way. Uh, feminists in Great Britain are, are relating to Indian political demands in another. Indians, of course, are expressing it in another way. But even someone like an Af African-American intellectual uh, can take heart uh, from Naroji's political work uh, tens of thousands of miles away in a distant continent. Um, so with that, um, I'll end my talk. Uh, thank you for, for listening. I know I've gone a little bit over time. 
uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. And if you have any more interest in Naroji, uh, I have some material on, on the website that I've, I've listed uh, over here. Thank you so much. I think that was a fascinating, uh, you know, capturing and encompassing such a vast and like a, you know, transnational life, like you have mentioned uh, in your book and in your abstract. Uh, so I think uh, there are uh, possibilities of a lot of curiosities probably, and I'm sure there will be questions also. And that's, uh, uh, I think what we can do is, since this is a closed uh, room, what we can do is, uh, we can just uh, open up uh, and and uh, if uh, Sham, can you just allow people to speak, uh, unmute themselves, or if you can just uh, raise your hand, then I can un unmute you, and then probably we can go around taking collecting some questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Farid Alatas. I'm from uh, from National University of Singapore. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Patel. I enjoyed the the talk very much. Um, I, I first came across uh, uh, Nauroji when I read um, this Introduction to Development uh, Theory by uh, Bjorn Hetna in the 1980s. Um, one of the very, very few, you, you must know the work, of course, one of the very few works on development studies which um, makes reference to, to Nauroji um, and, um, well, he says that he was... Uh, something of a precursor to dependency theory. Um, but um, uh, I, I was interested in, um, I, I know that you've written about Naraji and his, his um, correspondence or his contact with Orientalists uh, working on, uh, on Parsis. So my, my question is, is this, um, uh, to, to what extent do you feel that Naraji was uh, aware of the problems of Orientalism? Um, seeing that he was critical of, uh, you know, of British rule and so on and so forth, and he was active in terms of uh, on, on the political stage, but in terms of knowledge production, what what were his uh, his thoughts and what kinds of interventions uh, did he make? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so thanks for that reference. Also, I, I actually did not know of that reference, so that's 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 something good for for, for me to know. Um, in terms of Naroji's relationship with with Orientalism, yeah, I mean it. For the most part, um, he was one of those individuals who was um, attacking uh, notions of, you know, a quote unquote oriental inferiority, so to speak, right? In, in the sense that, you know, he actually engaged um, in a very dramatic uh, showdown, if you will, with uh, uh, with uh, one particular individual in 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 London uh, who had delivered a paper that was that was littered with all these kind of social Darwinist ideas of. Uh, you know what uh, what the differences were between Europeans or what he terms, termed Asi Asiatics and Naroji. Right after this individual had uh, given his presentation of you know, at the next meeting of I, I think it was uh, the Royal Society of Eth uh, the Society of Eth Ethnography in London, uh, literally takes apart this this person's talk talk and and says you know well you know you talk about Ori you know what about Orientals being lazy and Asians not being innovative, well, you know, what about all the crime that you see on the streets here in London? Uh, what about the lack of morals? What about the fact that colonialism is this whole system where you're, you're deliberately putting down other people? Um, at the same time, he also, I mean, you know, addresses the issue of race. Um, you know, why are, you know, differentials being, you know, drawn between, say, uh, people who are Iranian or Indian or Japanese or whatever? And he goes back in history and says, well, look, you know, prior to, uh, you know, the rise of European empires, you know, most of you know, the locus of, you know, economic growth and, uh, you know, cultural production would have been in a place like China or India or, or, or Iran. So in that sense, he's, he is, um, you know, in, you know, pushing back against those, those tropes of, of, of social Darwinism and European superiority. Um, at the same time, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, he was someone who, like us today, uh, would, you know, talk about some, you know, a completely colorblind, colorblind environment, uh, because he did subscribe himself to some ideas of uh, civilizational hierarchy in the sense that uh, you know if he wanted to talk about india's demands uh, for political uh, you know for, you know better you know better a polit better political uh, environment uh, he would say you know we are not hot and tops right which is a direct reference to saying you know we are not we are not like africans we have more civilization uh, so you know i mean we cannot excuse those references i mean i will qualify them by saying that in comparison with 99.9% of other political figures, uh, Naroji was not making those really egregious racial 
uh, statements. I mean, someone like Hinman, who was very progressive in all other streams, uh, was also a, a raging anti-Semitic, right? I mean, you know, he, you know, if, if you read Naruji, uh, Hinman's letters to Naroji, they are referenced all throughout with, with, you know, the Jews are like this and whatever. And, and he gets similar things from American anti-imperialists. And Naroji does not, in his responses, does not respond. He doesn't take that bait, or at least he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, really pick up on those ideas. Uh, he also hits out against uh, Britons for their attitudes towards the Irish. He was very conscious of uh, British racism towards Irish people, and you know, he defends Irish people to a very great degree. And he says, you know, uh, how can how can how can you Britons treat them as badly as as you've done over these past few centuries? Uh, so it's, the answer is complex. Um, you know, um, he's more progressive than most other people, but you know, he's still a Victorian, uh, and he's still subject to many of those those prejudices that that anyone would have been subjected to. Right. Um, can I quickly just just ask um, very quickly? You mentioned lazy. Um, was there actually any discussion about laziness, or the the accusation of na lazy uh, natives? So this particular, um, you know, the, this particular response that Naroji gives uh, in 1866, it, it's it's a paper he gives called the Rights of Man. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry, um, what, what am I talking about? The the, the the European and Asiatic races. It's, it's in response to a paper that was done, um, you know, just a week or so beforehand. And, and this this British Orientalist had uh, said, you know, things like, you know, the the natural tendency of a, of a Briton or a European was to stand, whereas the natural tendency of a of an Asian was to squat. Uh, and again, a lot of these ideas that were common at the time, you know, the Asian was uh, nowhere near as industrialist, industrious because of the weather and because of what have you. So yes, a, lo a lot of these attitudes are being uh, bandied around uh, in Naroji's circle and Naroji tries to swat them down one by one. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful question and for the response also. Uh, so we have a question from Patrick and he's asking that, uh, can you explain how far Naroji's Nauro comparative acceptance and success in a British and imperial context may have been connected with his Parsi heritage? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I think that there were definitely many ways uh, that Naroji did something that other Indians would have a very difficult time doing. Um, you know, for that reason, you know, I mean, the next book that I'm, the next book I'm working on, uh, I'm, I'm having a chapter on Lal Mohan Bush, who was a Bengali and was also the first Indian to stand for uh, the British Parliament in, 1880, in 1885. Um, and what you see with Ghosh, I mean, and Ghosh is again, you know, again, he's Bengali, he's much darker skinned than, uh, than Naroji. He speaks very good English. You know, he's probably as good of an English speaker as Naroji, but he faces much more racism, much more of a backlash, uh, you know, because of those British stereotypes specifically towards Bengali. Uh, for various reasons, uh, a lot of elite Britons had much more favorable views towards Parsis. Uh, Many, you know, many of those reasons were racial because Parsis were lighter skinned. Uh, many of those other views were due to the fact that Parsis had, of course, an unfair advantage economically and therefore were richer in a colonial environment. Um, but, you know, it's telling to compare someone like Ghosh with Naroji because, again, you know, Ghosh is being, again, caricatured as a Bengali bab uh, throughout the British press. Naroji, when Salisbury calls him a, a, black, a black man, uh, oftentimes, the most common defense against Naroji is no, actually, look at him, he's rather light skinned, which, of course, in our context is ridiculous, right? I mean, that's not the point that, that you know, we should really be talking about, but that was considered important, right? That this man can pass off as an Englishman uh, because he's relatively light skinned, he speaks good English, uh, and his manners are relatively, Anglo uh, you know, Anglophile. Uh, so, yes, to a large degree, I think being a Parsi helped. Uh, and it also helped that since he was in a community that already was very rich and had a lot of ties in Great Britain, he had a lot of friends. Uh, so, you know, who could help him in his activities. So, you know, Beramji Malbari is a very good example. I mean, Malbari is a fascinating guy because he didn't actually go to Great Britain until 1890 or so, but he was already in touch with people like Tennyson and, you know, other major political figures, John Bright and such. Uh, and he knew British politics probably as well as most British political commentators in spite of being, again, 10,000 miles away. And through people like Malbari, uh, the world of liberal politics, the world of, you know, Victorian culture is, is open to Naroji. And, you know, the, the same is true for 
uh, you know, the ties that someone like say a Jamshidji Tata or, you know, other prominent Parsis of this era could bring uh, to, to uh, Naroji. So yeah, it, it, does, it does unfortunately, uh, and I say unfortunately deliberately here, um, it, it helped Naroji in ways that would have been probably impossible for say uh, a Bengali or, you know, a member of another group in India to really take advantage of. But I have a follow-up question with relation to that question that uh, there was an interesting caricature that you showed in the presentation in which when Naroji is demanding for Swaraj, uh, he is depicted, there's a Hinduized kind of a car caricature. And I was just wondering that because he is Parsi, but he's shown to be depicted as a Hindu. Uh, was there this idea that Swaraj then is something that the Hindu Swaraj or the Hindus I mean, self-rule for the Hindus, or was that at that time the conception of religion blending into the idea of self-rule? Because uh, my question is basically to ask that: was what Savarkar later on writes about yeah. Hindutva and about you know uh, who should be ruling? Like right? the self-rule should be for whom? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering that: was there a precursor, uh, or was there that kind of an idea that if he's asking for Swaraj, he maybe is thinking from the Hindu line of thought or something of that sort. I wanted to understand why was that caricature, uh, you know, at that point in time, it was intriguing. So that's a very interesting image in the sense that it was done by a party, a, a Parsi artist published in Bombay and eventually republished in London. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, the depiction over there uh, is of Naroji with, you know, there's swastiks, he's, I think, you know, um, there's some other Hindu imagery, and that's that's one of several images that that show something similar. You know, in another image, uh, Naroji is holding a, a, a trishul. Uh, in another image, Naroji is 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 like a sadhu, uh, and I think that says more about again how, unlike today, uh, you know, there 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 was this kind of religious blending, not not necessarily you know Hindu dominated. I mean, this was this was a particular trope that that particular artist was going for, um, but I'm you know. I don't know myself, but I would not be surprised to see Naroji potentially being, you know, um, drawn in, say, uh, something more familiar with, to, you know, something with, with more mis Muslim political imagery as well. Uh, because in this era, it was possible to, you know, kind of straddle those boundaries. Uh, and, you know, it also talks, it, it also says a little bit about how Parsi, Parsi is acculturated within India. I mean, still today, we we use swastik sometimes in our, in our religious, you know, if, if, we, if we do, you know, some decorations for religious festivals and such like that. We, we've borrowed a lot of stuff from, from uh, you know, Hindu uh, iconography and, and uh, you know, religious symbolism. Uh, and at least in this era, it wasn't that much of a problem. Uh, you know, it's, again, to show you how much has changed between then and unfortunately now, uh, you know, when Britain start attacking uh, Naroji as being an unfit person to be a member of parliament, one of the tactics they use is they say he's a Pashti. He's not a Hindu, he's not a Muslim, and therefore he's not representative. And by and large, most Indians say nothing to it, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is not, uh, we don't care, he's an Indian. Uh, now, of course, you know, uh, things are different. Right, okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have three questions now. So, uh, Tana, uh, you can uh, go first, and then Aprajit, and then Amod. Uh, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Hi, uh, should I go? Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, hi, Dinyar. Uh, we had met at that IAM conference. How are you? Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I was just, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I was, since uh, this is about Dada Bhai Navarji, there's a very interesting story about him sending the first machine for the textile mills in Ahmedabad. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, you know, we very, very often uh, narrate that incident where uh, Ranchodlal Chotalal had ordered the uh, first machine. Uh, from uh, from Dada Bhai Navroji. Uh, do you have more information? Uh, you know, what are the kind of evidences that we have? Because when I, you know, when I bring this up in my business history class, uh, it's very interesting. And you know, it's, it was shipped. I think it was sh uh, shipped from uh, London, and then the first consignment sunk, and then the second consignment came, and I think it landed in Cambe, and from there it was it was brought in bullock carts uh, to Ahmedabad. Right? Uh, do we have more evidences uh, uh, to, to to kind of support this uh, this story? I so yeah, it, it's it's a it's a fascinating story. Uh, what I know at least, uh, you know, is is that again a lot of the sources from this are, are long gone, right? So I mean, the stories that we're hearing are, are 
via indirect sources or hearsay and such. But as far as I could tell with the story, what you know, what what you were talking about is 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 roughly correct in the sense that so Naroji was working in London. He operated a business that was uh, dealing in cotton machinery and also cotton exports and imports you know, going from India to Great Britain. Um, and so when Ranchutlal wanted to get a uh, you know machine for you know for 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 use in this mills, so he contacted Naroji, but that particular consignment sunk. Uh, now I I, I you know it, it sunk some, somewhere off South Africa. Um, I don't know about the second machine. I don't, I, I don't know if he got it from Nauruji or not, or if he got it from another uh, particular source, but certainly what you talk about it, you know, going to combat and being taken by bullet cart, that, that probably makes the most sense. I mean, I haven't seen that part of the story, but I don't see any other way they could get it, say, up the Sabarmati or, or anything else. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of uh, set, no, for all the textile history that follows, I mean, that yeah. was the first time that we are setting up the textile mills in late 19th century. I mean, for, it was radical for that time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that 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 really kind of uh, set the mills going for Ahmedabad. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know the unfortunate thing with the Naroji papers, and again a lot of the other sources that we have, as as you know, right, for Gujarat, is that you know we've done such a great job of destroying them uh, that we don't know what actually happened, right? So with Naroji's papers, most of the papers before 1886 are gone uh, because of humidity, white ants, your usual stuff, incompetence of the people who are dealing with them and our friends at Gujarat State Archives have also done a very good, effective job of destroying material um, when I've you know, discovered when I went to Baroda and such. Uh, so we don't know, unfortunately. Um, if you find anything about this, please let me know. I'd, I'd be interested. I mean, I, I, I wonder if, you know, a Gujarati paper- I will, thank you so much, Dunyar. Sure, 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 okay. Right, uh, we have uh, Aprajit, can you ask your question? Uh, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dinya, for a really thank fascinating uh, presentation. I'm sorry I'm not in a position to switch on my video, but um, no I, I, it, I, I want to continue on this theme of, um, of industry because um, I recall, I think in an earlier talk, you had spoken a little bit more about, um, uh, about the fact that uh, Nauruji was representing some business interests when he first went to to London, right? I mean, I mean, you you later spoke about the uh, the money he gets as donation from princely rulers and so on. But obviously, the, the big question one would get is what was he doing for a living, and uh, you know what what was his mode of sustenance to be living in London for so long, uh, and so on. Uh, so, to what extent did his you know business connections and so on influence his political views? Uh, and the second part of that question is: Is there any evidence of um, correspondence uh, or direct influence? on um, Ranade, because Ranade is the other person who talks a lot about industry and so on. And I'm kind of interested in knowing whether there's a, you know, there's a direct link in their uh, ideas development. And unfortunately, thank you for that, for those questions. Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, you know, if I were to summarize my question and uh, your, my answer in three words, it'd be, we, we don't know. <laughs> you know again, a, a lot of the sources are, are, are gone. So, so, I mean, dealing with your first question about, you know, what he was doing, what, 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 what were his business activities. So, you know, as I mentioned, he had this company. Um, prior to that, he worked for uh, the Kama family, which, which was, a, you know, enterprising Parsi family, which was first involved in opium and then went on to cotton. Um, and so he went with some Kama siblings and, uh, and relatives to, to set up a, a company in Liverpool and London that dealt in the cotton trade. There was some falling out. Again, we don't know precisely. There, there, there are various stories about what the falling out is about, but it's impossible to verify because those papers are gone. Uh, so by the 1860s, he has his own company, rather by Naroji and company. Uh, we have some documents from that company, but by and large, the really interesting, important stuff is gone. Um, so where I found information about the company was, you know, again, through a little bit of material in the Naroji papers, and then, then through something called Chancery Court Records. So um, just as Indians love to sue one another today, and which is why we have this, you know, wonderful, uh, a wonderful, you know, uh, you know, uh, court system with, you know, century long cases and whatever, Indians were very fond of suing people back then in that era also. And so um, I can tell a lot about Naroji's commercial activities because he was involved in various lawsuits in London. Uh, with various companies, both Indian and, and British, run out of you know London or Liverpool or whatever, and so that gives us a general clue of who he's dealing with. Um, at the same time, 
I can tell that by the 1860s or so, Nauruti is relatively rich because when many of his friends uh, lose money in the cotton, you know, uh, after the, you know, the, you know, the, the end of the American Civil War, when there's the, the share crisis and, uh, and, and stuff like that, Nauruti gives them loans. Um, and uh, unfortunately, many of them can't pay him back. So there's this whole train of like angry letters that Nauruti continues to write to the 70s, you know, you haven't paid me back, <laughs> you know, where's my money? <laughs> uh, so, so we can tell little bits here and there of, of his activities, but by and large, you know, the, the really interesting stuff about what his company was doing, I was unable to find much. I mean, again, there mm -hmm. might be some stuff somewhere in London. I mean, maybe at the London Metropolitan Archives or something. I was unable to get there. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to know more. Um, with regard to, to Ranade and Nauruji, again, the, the, the big stumbling block we hit upon is that Ranade's papers are by and large lost. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the Ranade papers that we have in, in the National Archives of India is hardly anything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there is correspondence between the two men and surely they were in touch with one another. One another. And, and mm -hmm. surely um, Nauruji knew what was going on with the, the, the Pune, Sarav Janak Sabha and such and Nauruji's mm -hmm. uh, and Ranade's writing. To the degree of what precisely was being discussed by the two men, I unfortunately can't say much. Um, because yes. again, that material disappeared 70, 80, 90 years ago. It's, right. it's, it's really unfortunate, um, you know, how much is, is missing from this era. Because uh, uh, Nauruji would have been slightly older, I think, about two decades or so. Right, right. right. He, he would have been older. I mean, again, he came from, you know, I mean, there's so many parallels, right? I mean, both went to Elphinstone. Uh, when um, uh, Nauruji has appointed Diwan of, of Baroda, one of the people he wants to have come uh, and work for him and Baroda is Ranade. And Ranade says, unfortunately, I can't come. I've been just appointed as a, as a judge. Uh, so there's so many places where the careers crisscross over one another. And of course, Gokhale was another common link. Um, you know, there must have been a fascinating relationship. But as, uh, you know, is the case for us, who study Indian history, as you know, we're, con we're condemned to not know due to the uh, the deterioration of archival materials. Yeah, I know. What a pity. But thank you so much. That's very helpful. Response. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prajit. Uh, now, so we have a question from uh, Amol and then Murari, and then we have Muskana student. So Amol, uh, you can proceed. Amol is yeah. Uh, hi, economics faculty. Yes. Hi, Daniel. Uh, we again met at the of course. IMA conference. Uh, so wonderful to hear you. I've obviously been hearing a lot of stuff and I think your SPJ and webinars are pretty interesting. Uh, so I've been sort of uh, you know, catching up with them too. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, uh, I just had a quick, uh, quick comments and uh, some questions. Uh, so one is this, uh, that you, when, you went, when you mentioned about the uh, princely, that Narodji kind of borrowing money uh, from these, uh, or the princely state guys, any ideas about the channels of finance? How is it working? I mean, how are they sending funds from India to, to there? What are the kind of, so being a finance sort of a person, I'm kind of interested yeah. in this. Uh, uh, you know, second is that you mentioned about uh, Narorji's, uh, you know, Stuart Mill and uh, and uh, possibility that he met Marx or did not meet Marx. I, I kind of missed, I, I was under the impression that this talk is at six, but somehow I missed the missed some 15, 20 minutes of it. So I don't know whether you covered all that. So any other uh, economic uh, historians uh, who uh, were of influence to Narology, anything uh, which apart from Marx and Smil, if you could help uh, me with. And obviously your reference to Malhar Rao uh, brought me to this history of Bank of Baroda where, uh, you know, Sayaji Rao comes in after the excesses of Malhar Rao and you know, he forms the Bank of Baroda. So that was just some kind of a comment on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Yes, and it's good to see you. Good, good to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Bank of Baroda thing is interesting because I remember about 10 years ago, Bank of Baroda had an ad campaign where they said, you know, banker to this Indian. And one, one of them featured Naroji's face. So, you know, presumably he had a Bank of Baroda account. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I talked a little bit about Naroji's, you know, most likely indirect ties with Marx in the sense that Henry Hinman was a common friend you know, probably transmitted a lot of Naroji's ideas of the drain to Marx toward the end of his life. Finding other thinkers who influenced Naroji or were influenced by him, it was difficult. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's one American scholar who talked about how he was in touch with, uh, with Friedrich List uh, and that List had a correspondence with Naroji. That's not the case. There is no correspondence. You know, I, I, I checked up and down in the Naroji papers and that's, you know, and I actually asked the scholar and she said, 
essentially my bad. Uh, so, you know, so it's, it's difficult to find those other influences. I mean, there, there were other very minor thinkers by our standards uh, who were in touch uh, with, um, with uh, Naroji, you know, economic thinkers at, at Oxford and, and Cambridge, but, you know, not, not, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, the classic example, of course, is uh, uh, with Hobson. Uh, you know, Hobson and Naroji were living in the same city, and Hobson was, of course, writing this treatise on, you know, imperialism, uh, you know, uh, and and economics. They did not seem to be in correspondence with, with one another, which 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 is shocking, right? I mean, living in the same city, having so many ideas in common, how could you not? be in correspondence with one another and unless they just you know deliberately destroy their correspondence or you know whatever um so it's difficult to trace many of those other lineages of, of economic thought uh in terms of you know the, the second question you asked with how this money was transmitted uh we don't really know uh, or at least i haven't found that that info as yet because it was done very deliberately uh, in a very secret manner uh so again you know i, you might, I don't know if you were on uh, the, the call when I showed that particular letter uh, where it's, it's saying, you know, ask K to ask T to send 50. It was done in a very deliberately vague manner. Uh, so just in case someone else read it, they wouldn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, so I don't know precisely how that took place. You know, I, I get a sense because, so I'm writing another paper right now that's looking at how Pisces conducted philanthropy in Iran in the 1880s. And one very interesting thing I find is how money was transmitted. So, you know, money would be raised in Bombay and it would be sent to Yazd in the center of Iran, right? How do you get money from, how do you get Indian rupees to, to Yazd? Well, it's very complex. You go through a bank and say, Bandar Abbas or, Bush, or Bushair. Oftentimes you go through the British legation, the British ambassador, and there's like a, uh, like a, a note of, you know, accreditation given to the person and, and money is exchanged there, thereafter. So perhaps money was being exchanged this way. Um, you know, since princely states might have had a bit more leverage to go outside of the bounds of the imperial financial system, quite likely, again, they're probably just transmitted to a bank in London, which then takes a huge percentage, perhaps 25% off the value, uh, pockets it, and gives the remainder to Naroji. Uh, unfortunately, in absence of material bank records, I, I just don't know. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we have Muradi. Uh, Muradi, you can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, thanks. It was, uh, it was a fascinating talk. Um, thank you. And I think I'm, I've not yet read your book, but I, I should do it uh, soon. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, I, I was wondering, um, you know, uh, obviously there are many negatives associated with uh, empire and imperial exploitation that we uh, know of and obviously Dada Vainaraji wrote uh, indicting the uh, British uh, colonial rule, but it also created a more integrated world in which individuals like Naraji could move around and take up the couches, which can even be at odds of the, uh, you know, um, empire uh, in general. So how do you bring in uh, this aspect of the age in which uh, you know, people could uh, correspond, correspond globally and, and, and such people could get opportunity to rise to such a level to, uh, to, to become truly global figure and take up the couches uh, globally, um, some couches from different parts globally. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this must be there in your book, but I just thought... Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I mean it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? In the sense that, you know, before email, before really the telegram, um, before an era when chances are your letter uh, would actually arrive rather than sinking somewhere off the coast of South Africa, uh, people were in such detailed correspondence with people around the world. Uh, and I mean, I think to answer your question, you know, we have to realize that this level of close correspondence obviously goes back much earlier, right? In the sense that, um, you know, Ramohan Roy was in correspondence with people in Boston in the 1820s, you know, direct correspondence. I mean, he was in, you know, he was so well known in Spain that, you know, the, the, the Spanish Cadiz constitution was dedicated to him in, 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 in second, second publishing in the 18, 1820s, right? So, you know, the world was more globalized than we think in, in many ways. Now, of course, it took a long time to get your letter and chances are you might, may not have got that letter at all. Uh, and this comes up a lot in correspondence. 
you know, a, a lot of the correspondence I saw was along the lines of, I didn't receive your last letter. I can't receive, I can't read your last letter. You, you know, your, your telegram did not come through or the, the British person who was trans, you know, transmitting my telegram misspelled all the Indian words I used and therefore, you know, whatever message I give to you is, is garbled. In spite of all this, they managed to do it. I mean, it, it says a lot about the persistence of these people. Um, one, one thing I talk about in the book is how really in many ways the Congress was at, in, its, in its early decades, a transnational movement. Uh, you know, when, when they put together a, a report of the Congress, uh, they do it from multiple, not just multiple cities, but multiple continents. You know, I mean, uh, Hume might be in Great Britain. Now, Ruji is in, in London also, but the other people are in Madras, Bombay, Calcutta, <clears throat> and they're all corresponding with each, with each other. It, it takes several months, but eventually they put it out. Um, how do they do this in, in, in spite of, you know, again, more dependable communication? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is a bit of a mystery. Um, I, I guess, I mean, the one thing we can say though, is that again, if you are an Indian who can speak English and speak English well, and can actually convey a lot of intellectual points in a, in a manner that, you know, is thought of as being unique and such, you obviously can go much farther than you obviously can today, right? I mean, when there's just so much competition and, you know, there are millions of us who are competing for, for different things, people like Naroji were, were unique, right? In the sense that, um, you know, uh, he was able to gain so much access um, in a way that, you know, a contemporary like us today would have difficulty doing that, right? I mean, to be utterly frank, right? I mean, the world was a less competitive place in some ways. Of course, it was more, it was more disadvantaged for an Indian because of all the racism and colonialism and such, but there are ways that Naroji was able to navigate around these uh, barriers and somehow rise to the top. But for every person like Naroji, there were others, again, who it didn't work that well. Again, Lal Mohan Ghosh is a good example. I mean, he was in many ways as qualified as Naroji. Um, he was as good of a speaker. He had ties with many important um, British politicians like John Bright, and yet he disappears from the political stage by around 87, 88. Evidently quite a bit of that, you know, because of his experiences. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we have a student, a uh, question from a student, uh, and perhaps this will be uh, the last. Maybe I can take the advantage of my position as the uh, moderator to ask one, but that will be the last question. Yes. Sure, uh, sure. Mustan, please. Uh, I also had a question related to Dada Bhai, Dada Bhai Navroji and uh, Karl Marx, actually. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a third year entrepreneurship student and I have to tell you my knowledge of history is, is actually somewhat uh, messed up. Uh, but uh, my, oh my. my question was that, uh, how are they related? I mean, was it just that Dadabhai Navroji, uh, I mean, told Karl Marx about uh, the situation in India or or, or was he influenced by Karl Marx as well to some extent? Because as far as I know, uh, any Marxist would uh, despise the idea of nationalism and call it a bourgeois, a tool by the bourgeoisie class to maintain their uh, bourgeois state and all these things. But there was also a point in the principles of communism by uh, the QA by Engels that. Uh, in countries which were not yet independent at that time, uh, the first, first there has to be a capitalist revolution where the freedoms movement happens and then a socialist revolution. So uh, what was Dadabhai Navroji's ideology exactly? I mean, was he uh, very well into uh, working for, I mean, was his uh, ideology and work more for uh, people who are from the uh, marginalized communities and working class in India, or was it for overall India in general, as in nationalist or proletarian type? That, that's yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. So, um, you know, th the short answer to your question is that you know all the dynamics that we now have, you know, like com you know the, the the communist leftists that as we we, we view them in in India and their relationship with you know say like a nationalist or or whatever. That's a relatively recent vintage, right? In the sense that, that that probably only really develops after World War One. This this kind of like Indian communism within India. Yes. Um, so this is the 1880s in comparison. So it's it's a very different dynamic. I mean, Naruji was a socialist in the sense that he believed that the government should have a degree of control and regulation of capitalism, uh, but he wasn't a communist. 
um, yeah. you know, he, he wasn't someone who believed in, you know, the total, you know, and, and classic communism, of course, is very different from, say, what current day communists in India might think of us. It's, it's complex. <laughs> I mean, as, as many things with, with, with politics are. Uh, but, you know, people like Marx and Engels were, were actually very interested in India, uh, not just from the standpoint of, you know, the British colonial connection, but, you know, I mean, you know, just, just what it tells us about capitalism in general, right? I mean, so when, when Marx is, is writing that particular letter, which I mentioned, he's, he's talking about how, you know, I mean, obviously Marx's main point is that capitalism is exploitative, right? Uh, and that it, it hurts, you know, the working class. Uh, and, you know, this drain theory appealed to someone like Marx because it, it, it was an example of how colonialism, which was, you know, linked to capitalism, British capitalism in this case, was making uh, a group of other people completely, completely separate from the British economy, uh, it, at least the British domestic economy, very poor. Uh, so that was an example, again, of capitalist exploitation. And, you know, I mean, one could go on in details, but I won't, I won't, I won't bore you about that, about the particular mechanisms, but, but that's, that's how India uh, really interested someone like Marx, right? Um, Marx had his own prejudices about, about Indians, as he did with other people. He was still, you know, he's, he's a remarkable thinker in many ways, and far more, uh, you know, forward-minded than, than many other uh, people of, 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 his, of his era. Uh, but, you know, it, it was in that specific context. Um, now, as to your question of, you know, who was Naroji really interested in, kind of like a, a bourgeoisie or a proletariat, um, it's, again, a complex question in the, in the sense that, so, um, Naroji was very pro-worker in, in Great Britain. So he went to... Um, you know, uh, union activities. He talked to people who were striking. He supported strikers. Uh, he was in favor of things like an eight-hour workday. Uh, he was in, in favor of things, um, you know, like labor courts, which, you know, special institutions where, you know, labor would be given uh, greater power vis-a-vis -vis capitalists. But the one thing that was very striking to, in, in my opinion, is that he says very little about working conditions in India. Uh, you know, once or twice there are references here and there to workers in India. Um, so most of his interest was actually in, on workers' conditions in Great Britain. Uh, he has far less to say about workers in India. There are a few reasons why. I mean, first of all, his, his, his uh, reason for really uh, trying to speak to a lot of workers in Great Britain is to, get, is to get their votes, right? I mean, so Indian workers are not going to give them their vote, uh, his votes, right? Because they, they can't vote. Uh, and the second reason is because the working class, I mean, the industrialized working class in India at this time was extremely small percentage wise. I mean, it was by and large a little bit in Bombay, a little bit in Ahmedabad, a little bit in Calcutta, not much else, right? So um, this changes by the end of Naroji's career, by the early 20th century. But I did find it striking that he, he spoke very little about workers' conditions in India. And I'll, I'll just say something extra. I mean, in relation to that, I mean, you know, nationalism eventually by, by you know, the 1920s develops a very strong element on things like caste and, you know, the idea of, you know, helping lower caste people, which of course blends in with, with a general idea of, you know, helping the most disadvantaged people. In Naroji's political writing, there's hardly anything about caste. I mean, it is just a glaring absence. Yeah. Uh, he makes a few references here and there to, you know, the lower orders, uh, the less well off, uh, but, you know, perhaps as a Parsi, you know, I mean, we don't really have castes um, and, perhaps as someone who was so removed from India for so long, caste was just not in his mind to the same degree as it was, say, like a, Gok a contemporary like Gokhale. Uh, so that's another way which the nationalism of that era was just massively different from, say, what nationalism is like we think of in Gandhi's era, or even whatever the nationalism that we think of what's going on today is like. Right. No, I think that is exactly what my question was about that, because you also mentioned the idea of the uh, African-American literature also getting inspiration from or activists also getting inspiration from Naoroji. And now we see that there is an equivalence being drawn about caste and race yeah. you know, uh, uh, in, in both the countries. And therefore, I was also wondering that, you know, whether, whether caste figures, because also Elphinstone College, we know that Ambedkar taught in a bit, uh, yeah. you know, Elphinstone College. So he's also part of that alumni, uh, that glorious tradition. So definitely, and I was expecting something like this, that caste would not be featuring much. Uh, so uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, I mean, there is another question, but I think because we have already exceeded five minutes. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I would like to thank you and 
so much. This was such a fascinating and very engaging uh, conversations that we have had. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dinya, for this wonderful lecture and for this wonderful, you know, very, very insights, uh, very good insights about uh, Dada Bhai Nauroji. And I think what just uh, stands out from the, today's talk is again, how I began that, uh, despite when you said that Congress was actually a transnational entity or, you know, the history was being written from so many different continents. And even despite uh, Nauroji's connections in, in Britain, in different several other places, uh, the Indianness would not be questioned. And I think that is something uh, which is a, a good message for today's times uh, that we can take from, from learning you know, about such historical figures. Uh, thank you so much. With that, we would like to conclude um, this event. And thank you so much, Dina. And thank you to all the participants for taking uh, your time out today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and thanks to Sartak, uh, to, to Suchi, and, and to everyone else at Amdabana University for inviting me. It's been a pleasure talking to you.